I'm Raj Kumar here again in Brussels at the European Development Days and uh, joined by a very special guest, the Assistant Administrator for USAID, Nancy Lindborg. Uh, Nancy is Assistant Administrator for Dacha, I think is the, the way people describe it. Yes, uh, not a Russian guest house. Right, right. But uh, if I get the acronym right, it's uh, Democracy, Conflict and Humanitarian Assistance. Um, and you have been, I think this month, two years That's in this right. role. That's right. Um, after coming out of running a, an NGO. So, I guess I'm curious to know, how have those two years gone? Give us some sense of the reflections from those two years. I know it's been a very busy two years, Arab Spring, South Sudan, Horn of Africa crisis, a lot on your plate. How has it been? Um, well, that was a good list. Um, it's been a, a wild, hectic time, yeah. um, but I think filled with, this, with a lot of energy. I mean, AID right now has um, very, very positive energy in terms of tackling some of these issues with some new approaches. Um, it's been a good time to, to be uh, inside AID and the Dacha Bureau. Uh, I think for AID is, is um, you know, we're really lucky to have that bureau with that assembly of capabilities because it's acknowledging the central role of inclusive democratic governments without which you're less able to manage conflict and you're more likely to need humanitarian assistance. So it's acknowledging those relationships even in the name of the Bureau, which is what excited me from the beginning to come in and do this work. Sure. And I know you're here today talking about this term resilience, which seems to have taken over. It's ubiquitous now. Uh, I guess we're in a world where there's more conflicts. Uh, we've got climate change. There seems to be more natural disasters. You've got rapid urbanization. All kinds of things are happening at once. Right. Um, resilience. Uh, tell us a little bit about what, what you think it means. What does it mean to you? Um, and what does it mean now for the agency to be adopting a resilience-based approach? So, you know, one of the first things I did when I came to Washington in 1996 was attend a meeting at the Brookings Institute called Closing the Gap, which was everybody coming around and saying, how do we knit together more effectively the humanitarian and development actions and activities? So this is not a new problem. What I'm very excited about is that I think the resilience agenda has uh, given us new energy and a different tact to address that problem of not waiting until after a crisis hits to respond. And then typically we rush with humanitarian assistance and then at the conclusion of that it all goes silent and the development actions may happen over here in another part of the same country. So what the resilience agenda does is say we have got to have more focus on prevention and we've got to make sure that all that good work that we do during the emergency side with with substantial benefits that we're seeing and we move the needle that it connects up to that longer term so we we've done good work at maybe the household and the community level but it's got to connect up to the systems level through the connection with development there is international momentum right now, yeah. fueled by the Horn of Africa and the Sahel, which were devastating crises, and everybody agreed we need to do different, we need to do business differently. Mm -hmm. To me, it seems like getting that integrated strategy is a key part. There does seem to be a lot of momentum behind it, but probably the challenge is, well, how do you actually change the way aid agencies work to integrate across all these different functions? Yes. Um, and I imagine that's something you're going to be tackling with this new policy on resilience that USAID is putting out. And, and you mentioned in a panel today that there are going to be HR and procurement implications, that there's really you know, nitty gritty details that matter a lot to getting this right. I thought maybe you could expand on that a little bit. What, what, what might we see out of USAID on this? So, so USAID is putting together program and policy guidance that will be forthcoming um, in the next few weeks. Uh, this has been an all-agency effort. This has uh, really, I think, moved us forward on breaking down these steel pipes, these silos of excellence, and understanding that these challenges that we're facing um, when uh, development gains can be lost if you don't pay attention to the shocks and stresses, this, this, is, this is an all-sector issue and it is an interdependent set of solutions. So we put together joint planning cells um, in Nairobi for the Horn of Africa and in Dakar for Sahel. 
So these are relief and development people sitting together around the table. I know it sounds like it should be the norm, but it isn't. These are different cultures, different tempos, different planning approaches. By bringing the teams together, they used a, an evidence basis to develop a joint analysis. What is the key driver of vulnerability here? What are the ways that we need to move this forward? And come up with a, a strategy that brings together both relief and development capabilities. So we're not, we're not losing that fast, flexible, life-saving assistance, and we're not encompassing all of development, but we're bringing them together uh, through layering, through sequencing, and through integrating our programming. And in the Horn of Africa, the plan that was produced says that by 2017, we will directly benefit 10 million people and move a million people off the emergency caseload for the next time a disaster hits in a focused geographic area in the dry lands of Kenya and Ethiopia. That's a big goal. It's a big goal. Yeah. It's a big goal. And we understand that we need to do that in partnership with the other international development partners mm -hmm. and map it against country plans. Yeah. And that's exactly one of the things I was going to ask you, which is you came out of a major NGO working in these areas. What will this mean, this new strategy, for your NGO partners? How might it affect the way they work on these resilience issues and on relief? Well, interesting, I think a lot of the, the NGO partners have moved ahead with their own resilience approaches. There's nothing like being at the front lines of a crisis and then seeing it again to increase your conviction that we have to do things differently. And oftentimes it's the, it's the donors who are more stovepiped than the NGO partners and certainly that more than the communities that we're serving. And so understanding that these are often artificial divides um, I think has been a, a, a critical piece of moving forward. There are wonderful strategies that have come out of the humanitarian world and there's excellent work that happens on the development side, but we're not linking them up. And so that's one of the heartbeat parts of this. Drawing on disaster risk reduction work, drawing on the adaptation work from global climate change, and saying we don't live in a world where you can afford to be so stovepiped and still have the solutions we seek. You know, as we wrap up, one of the nice things about coming to a conference like European Development Days is that you get inspired again. You know, we're, we're in the middle of a Euro, uh, Eurozone crisis in the U.S. We've got fiscal austerity. Uh, but yet it seems like, listening to you, there are some answers out there, there's some solutions, we're moving ahead. You've been in this job two years now, looking at the future, are you optimistic? Do you think we're going to get through some of these pretty substantial changes that, that you and, and all of USAID are pushing forward, major new policies, reforms to procurement and human resources, are we going to get there? I don't think we can afford not to. The loss of human life, the amount of suffering, the economic losses from these repeated crises when we're not looking at what is the vulnerability. Uh, World Bank came out with data that if, if you don't address the vulnerabilities based on historical patterns, basically one out of three development dollars is vulnerable to loss. Um, we know that in the Horn of Africa, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 billion was um, lost from the Kenyan economy. And that, that's in addition to the, the huge amounts of humanitarian assistance that went in. Um, and, and that doesn't even begin to talk about the impact at the family and household level. And, and it, I had a, a chance to go visit with any number of communities over the last year in the Horn of Africa where they cannot withstand going through more crises. Their coping mechanisms are getting more worn down. We don't, I think, have an alternative. We've got to get better at doing this, and the data is very persuasive for why. Sure. And in an era where cost effectiveness, value for money matters, you can make a real case for this. So. You, you can, and when you see the difference between a community where you know, women have been involved, they've had alternative livelihoods, they've had investment in a way that sets them up for the longer term, it's very compelling. Well, thank you for this important work. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your attention to this issue. Absolutely. Thank you.